Where is InsureTech headed next? This is where indie agents own the answer. Welcome to the Vertifor Insurance Podcast. Let's go. Welcome back to another episode of the Vertifor Insurance Podcast. I'm I'm just going to be real with you guys. Today, uh, we, we might, we are, we are, we are going to get a little uncomfortable. Not we might, not we, not maybe. It, it's probably going to happen if you're listening. So I, I'm... I'm giving you that PSA um, kindly uh, because we want you to stay for this entire episode. This is a really important conversation. Um, you know, I like to think in life the toughest conversations are the most important ones, and we're going to try and handle it with the most grace, kindness, love, inclusivity that we possibly can. Um, but I have to tell you, because of those things, I am so excited for this conversation. Um, this is, this is an interview with a person that I've been able to watch for the last couple years um, rise in the industry as someone who is a, a thought leader, someone who really thinks outside the box and challenges the status quo. And, um, and she puts her money where her mouth is. Um, she's not out there as a you know, influencer, social poster on Instagram. Um, she has started uh, a company with an mission, an entity that uh, she wakes up and caffeines herself to move forward every day in a meaningful way to, to truly create change in the industry. So we're going to dig in with her today. Uh, we're going to ask some tough questions of ourselves. Uh, we're going to ask some tough questions of the industry. And um, hopefully you're able to walk away asking yourself some tough questions too. So with that... Uh, Alyssa Stamp from Insure Equality, founder, CEO. How are you? I'm doing well. And yes, very caffeinated. <laughs> Thank you for, for letting everyone in on that little secret. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I can't not. What was the no. what was the caffeine of choice today? Um, I my spouse and I use Mio Energy all the time okay. because I, just, okay. I I love water and I won't drink it if it doesn't taste like water or if it tastes like water, I'm not drinking it. So I need something yeah. that's going to, it's going to take me to the next level. So we've got the acai berry, we've got black cherry. I think that's what I'm going hard on today. What's your caffeine of choice? Um, so you can't we'll see the tough questions first. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, might as well. We, you can't see Trayvon in the studio today. He is running the ship, but he just gave you a double thumbs up and a head nod. What, like one thumbs up would have meant good. So you're, you're initiated. You're in the, you're on the so island. Yeah, Wonderful. yeah, with a with blackberry Miro, is that what you said? Mio, a black Mio. cherry and black uh, cherry. acai berry. Yeah. Acai berry. Okay, I'll have to try those. I I'm a straight espresso and oat milk kind of person. Like, give it to me okay. straight. Uh, you know, don't fancy it up. And although I will say, when we were in Chicago having breakfast, and you shared that that tea, the Thai caffeine with the ca- coffee, that was interesting. That was pretty good. Yeah. Thai yeah. tea, yeah, it's got some spice in there. It's got a little bit of uh, extra cream, but man, that'll kick you right in. It does. Yeah, it's really good. <laughs> uh, that uh, place is Sweet Bean for any Chicagoans, if you want to check it out. Now you know. Uh, Yelp now away. You know. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get into it. Um, tell me a little bit about you, your story. Um, why insure equality? Why insurance? How did you come to be who you are today? Oh my goodness, we don't have that kind of time. But uh, what I will say, I'll give people a little bit of background because I think I've peppered it throughout the podcasts I've done or the speaking that I've done, but we'll go, you set it up very nicely. Like we're gonna get uncomfortable. So let's just go all the way, right? So here's here's the full unadulterated Alyssa backstory. So I'm the oldest child of five. I'm a rainbow baby, which means I was the baby born after a miscarriage. Um, to two parents that found each other late in life, both military. Uh, I was born on a military base, stayed there two weeks, and that was California. So I would love to say I'm from there, uh, but I don't think I have, I don't think I have the chops to say I'm officially from there. So we're going to call Chicago home for now. But um, we grew up in poverty. I was on food stamps Mm -hmm. and I grew up in an abusive household as well. Mm -hmm. And the reason I bring all of that up is because you asked 
who I am today, how did I get here? I think growing up the way that I did added a little extra fire that I probably wouldn't have gotten had I had other opportunities afforded me in life. And I think what's important to recognize is that we all carry those. Mm. We all carry those little moments with us that remind us that we were not enough or lesser than, or we get that look that somebody's like, oh, you have a lot of privilege. And I do, and I also don't. And so I think it's really important to understand intersectionality in this context. It was a term coined by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw. While you're Googling sweet bean, uh, you can also Google <laughs> intersectionality by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, phenomenal work. And it's important because I think when we talk about the subject of DEI, the work that Ensure Equality is doing, it's so easy to go, well, this isn't for me. You know, it's, it's so easy to go, well, this doesn't apply to me. This doesn't help me or, or you're coming after me because of who I am and how I look. And so I want to be clear that that is not at all the case. Mm. Um, I have a lot of love in my heart for insurance. It was uh, the industry that I landed in after being in an industry that I didn't like. Mm -hmm. So I was an 08 millennial. So I got the job that I could get, not the job that I wanted. And I went straight into banking. Oh, and I didn't like it, Sid. <laughs> I didn't like it at all. I mean, I can't say I'm surprised. It's, it's banking. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Yeah. You know, uh, if there's anything that will end a networking conversation sooner than insurance, it might be banking. So That's I was, <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, there was something about it. I was like, this is not for me. This is not, this is not my bag. And so somebody was like, why don't you check out insurance? And so I went home and Googled underwriting and I was like, you know, I think I could do this. Um, and then fell in love with an industry that has an abundance of opportunity, an abundance of, op yeah, just opportunity at its fingertips for everybody. Uh, I think the basis of insurance is inclusivity, but I don't think the manifestation of it currently is. Mm. And that's why insure quality exists. Um, there's so many podcasts out there with me telling my story. So I'll give you the abridged version so that we can get into it. Mm -hmm. Because the other piece that I want to call out is I want to make sure that people know that like this, in, this company, Insure Quality, is not just me. Um, I co-founded it with somebody who has also had her bouts in the industry. And we have a board of, you know, it's going to be over 20 individuals as we're rounding out recruitment right now. There's plenty of us that feel a specific way. And what I want to be able to do throughout this conversation, we are going to get uncomfortable. We are going to go there. But we there is a clear delineation between the emotion of it and the data and the logic behind it, too. So as we walk down this road, I want to make sure that people understand that where this is coming from is it's not a place of hurt or anger. I mean, that certainly exists. But the goal is to create a space that works for everybody in an industry that's supposed to be designed for everybody. So in 2021, well, really it started in 2020, and I don't think I have to tell you or anybody what 2020 made us do to our <laughs> lives, that how it made us go inward, thinking about all the ways that, you know, what did I do that led me here? What could I be doing differently? And I too went introspective and I'm queer. I'm bi and I wasn't open about it in the industry because I had the luxury of not being open about it. I typically had a male partner. I was married to a man, a cisgender man. And so for me, it was like, well, who really needs to know this? Like, it'll be fine. And then in 2020, I was like, no, I would have loved for somebody to be out and bi and older than me in this industry. I'll do it. And so I came out. Mm. And then I lost a lot of friends. Mm. Mm -hmm. And then I moved to the agency side and I said, you know, that's fine. This will be fine. I'm going to use who I am to hold the door open for somebody else that's like me that just isn't here yet. And within four months, I was being forced out. Now, I could give you the details of it, but like I said, this is on other podcasts. What I will say uh, that may not be on others is uh, they changed the address. So I actually had no idea where the office was for a couple months. They changed my passwords to access things. This wasn't a matter of whether or not my work was good. It was a matter of whether or not they thought I was going to do something to them because of something that they did to me. Hmm. And so while we sit with this little bit of discomfort, what I want to remind everybody of is uh, that I got out. 
and that I'm okay. And not everybody has that same fate. Mm -hmm. Because when I got on a Zoom call, because again, we're still in the pandemic, <laughs> while all of this is going on, when I got a Zoom, when I got on a Zoom call hosted by Meg McKean and a whole bunch of other incredibly powerful women in insurance, there really wasn't a lot of similarity between us. And we're going to harken back to that word intersectionality. So if you looked it up, you know what it means now. That there was a lot of intersectionality on that call. And somebody looked at me through the camera and she goes, Alyssa, what's up? And I shared. I shared the whole thing. And I was terrified. I thought for sure I was going to get blamed for everything that happened. And I was kind of at the point where I didn't care. But what I was met with was this chorus of women from all different sectors of the industry, backgrounds, experience levels, races, sexual identities, et cetera, going, yeah, that happened to me too. And it happened to my mom and my sister, and my friend, and my coworker. And we went around and we shared stories for what seemed like days, but I'm sure it was just like an hour and a half yeah. <laughs> on a Zoom call. Yeah. And statistically speaking, that was astounding to me. Mm -hmm. I was like, holy cow, it's all of us. And not just all of us, but all of us maybe multiple times over, maybe, you know, including friends and relatives and how people in our realm experience our pain too. Because I think about, you know, anything that happens to somebody in their family, it's going to impact everybody else around them. And even more so now, as we've gotten out of the pandemic and people are still trying to figure out what's next for them, you know, if they're at home with their kids, et cetera. So, it was a really tough moment, but what it led to was something that was incredibly beautiful because I just started picking up the phone at that point. And I said, well, I know I need to do something. I have no idea what the something is. All I know is that we can do better and that I care about this industry enough that I want to see it do better. I want to be able to recommend that my niece works in insurance. And right now, and especially then, I couldn't. Mm -hmm. And so I picked up the phone. I said, what have you experienced? What would you change? What's going on? And within six months, we built a team, a board, and launched a nonprofit with a mission to uplift the voices in our industry that are typically excluded or minimized. Mm -hmm. And here we are, <laughs> two years later, with an award-winning tech product. We launched a certification. And then I think the biggest piece of it for me that sits in my heart is the summit we just held on September 15th. And there were two comments that I told you before we started, and I'll bring them up again because I think it's important to the conversation as we peel back the layers. And one is, you changed my mind about insurance in one day. Mm. And the other was, I have never been in a space where I felt like I automatically belonged. Mm. Mm -hmm. And my hope and my goal for this industry is that we hear that so much more. Mm-hmm. I know that you've probably been in a room where somebody was like, oh, what are you doing? <laughs> you drop the word insurance and you see the glaze come over the eyes. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe they exit stage left immediately. Um, I would love to be able to have a young professional say that they work in insurance and have everybody go, oh, what part of the industry? What do you write? Mm -hmm. Tell me more about it. Wouldn't that be cool? And I think it's possible. Yeah. <sighs> I just want to yeah, we can, stop take some breaths. <laughs> for a sec and say thank you for being so open and uh, vulnerable. What I worry about in conversations like this is we stay too either too intellectual and too abstract with concepts, which we'll get to the data and trends and, you know, we'll talk philosophy and all different issues, right, that are affecting the industry. But the other issue is, you know, we could get too wrapped up in in one story, right? And, and um, you just have this amazing ability to merge both of those things to say, hey, this is real and it exists because I experienced it and my experience was real. And it's also backed by the knowledge that this isn't just happening to me and we have to talk about what that really means. So thank you for creating that space. I really, really appreciate it. And I know those listening who have, you know, experienced uh, similar things in the industry uh, really, really appreciate that. So um, 
Whew. So let's talk about the the problem that insure equality is is trying to solve, right? I mean, I um, it, it how how would you, I guess, to step back for a sec, how would you explain that to to someone, right? Like what what is the what is the root thing or the root issue? Is it is it intersectionality? Is it discrimination? Is it lack of diversity? Is it all of those things? Is it something else? Like, <laughs> I mean, it could be both and, right? I don't okay. know <laughs> we're not having an either or type of conversation. I think yeah. the, the next best place to go. And thank you for creating the space for this conversation to be held. Because I will, what I will say is, you're right. Sometimes we spend so much time on one side and not on the other. And to be able to have this conversation on a business podcast is absolutely music to my ears. Because I think you and I both knew when we were growing up in the industry, something like this didn't exist. Nope. So for that, I'm grateful. Nope. Not at all. Not at all. Um, and how often do you get to hear two powerful queer women have a conversation about insurance on a podcast? It, for that, I'm also incredibly grateful. I, I, yes, it is very, it's very cool. I didn't think this moment would actually, I mean, I, I truly, like, if I think back 10 years ago when I left my dad's agency um, and shortly thereafter found out I would not be able to run or own his agency, which I knew was coming, uh, there was no, there were no voices like this, uh, you know, talking about diversity and inclusion. Um, it was only like a year or so before that, that gay marriage was even legalized. So it was very new to the country, let alone the insurance industry. Um, so definitely grateful for where we're at today. So yeah, continue. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. I didn't mean no, to just, no. yes, I just wanted to take a moment and yeah. Oof. But I think it's the right moment because like, here we are, what we're both in our, I'm not going to say your age publicly, but I'm 36. So like, we're both probably in our thirties, if I had to guess, you know, so people, you know, people say I'm 12, but yeah, th we'll go 33 is the real age. Okay. So, you All know, right. like, so we're in our thirties yeah, and we grew up in the world that didn't have what we have right now. Yeah. And I think that is part of the message yeah. for what the, the issue is, Yeah, is that there are so many beings people in our communities, in our society that are technically stakeholders of insurance. Because if you think about stakeholders in insurance, not shareholders, mm -hmm. stakeholders in insurance, it's all of us. Mm -hmm. There's not an industry outside of our basic needs that touches everybody more than insurance. Mm -hmm. And so when we think about the leadership, how we're making decisions, who's making those decisions, do those voices represent the communities that they're serving, serving. And I would say by and large, no. And I would say mm. that is the root, that is the deepest part of the issue. Now, it is certainly more nuanced and layered and more difficult than that to kind of peel all of the pieces back because there's not oh. one thing that, that we will do that is that just one firebrand that will change everything and all of a sudden it's all fixed and it's magical and it's wonderful and it's beautiful. It takes work, right? And it takes effort. And the other thing I want to say, because I don't know that I've said this publicly, but based on some conversations I've had recently, I want to say the point of what we're doing is not to eradicate white men from leadership. Mm -hmm. The point of what we're doing is to make sure that everybody gets a chance to weigh in on a decision. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is profit. It's also people. Mm -hmm. It's also making sure that what we do in insurance as professionals is as effective as it can be. Mm -hmm. Because if we are not talking to people in our communities, do we understand our communities? Do we know what they need? And are we meeting them where they need to be met? Right, right. And if we're not doing that, then what we've done is we've said, well, we can only make profit from 63% of the population. And we're cutting out the other 37%. Mm -hmm. There's profit there too. Mm -hmm. So there is a balance of understanding that this, I think you said it beautifully earlier, this isn't just all the social aspect and it isn't all just the business aspect. It's about understanding that the two of them intersect because humans run businesses and businesses affect humans. Mm -hmm. Wow, beautifully put. Um, yeah. I, what came to me as you were talking was this image of, and this I, I heard a long time ago, 
um, more around being inclusive to to females, right? To to making sure that women are represented in in business. And there's sort of this, well, there's only six seats at the table, right? And so, hey, the goal is to just get one of those six seats instead of saying, well, why shouldn't we create a seventh seat or an eighth seat? And to me, you know, one comes from a scarcity mindset, which is like, ah, there's only six seats. Whoever created the six seat rule must have known, like, that's it. There's no more bread to go around, right? There's no more milk at the grocery store. Whatever's there is there. And the person who said there's a seventh or eighth seat came from that abundance mindset to say, well, what if? What are the possibilities and why not? Um, and so, you know, as we approach this conversation, I think that is really important to note, right? I mean, I'm sure there are people who pr- approach the the diversity, equity, and inclusion conversation saying, well, there's only six seats at the table. But what I'm hearing is we're saying, hey, there should be a seventh and eighth, right? So- Or ninth, 10th, and 11th. I, I right. think we've really limited, I, I think you're spot on with that. I think we've really limited our ability to grow and innovate as a people, as an industry, by saying these are the voices that matter for this conversation. And I agree with you, there's a scarcity mindset piece and and so much of that comes from fear. Mm -hmm. And if we think about what the insurance industry is, we're managing risk, right? Mm -hmm. There's so much fear involved Mm -hmm. in risk. Mm -hmm. So I look at the situation, especially in insurance with so much empathy, because I understand what it means to work in an industry where you're trying to prevent every ill from happening, you know, and it's, it's not possible. It's not possible. And it does grade on you or grate on you after a while that, oh, we, we couldn't stop that. We couldn't save that. And thinking about all of the claims reps that are looking at somebody's worst day over and over again, it's, it's hard and necessary work that we do yeah. in this industry. And I think for an industry that has so much history mm-hmm. behind it mm-hmm. and so much future ahead of it, we're kind of in this paralysis by analysis lock right now. Mm-hmm. So let's let's set the stage if you're okay with me doing that yeah, because there's absolutely. a lot of things that are happening right now that I think are indicative of this like beautiful and painful moment that we're in. I've been hearing since I've been in the industry and that was in early 2012 that we've struggled to recruit and retain talent. Mm-hmm. It's 2012 or yeah, so that's been what, 11 years? We've also started to see a whittling away of the competitive landscape, especially as it pertains to independent agents or agents of any size, because in 2021, we led the globe in mergers and acquisitions Mm -hmm. in insurance. Mm -hmm. So we're Mm -hmm. seeing a lot of that power consolidate to the top. And we have a generation or several generations coming up that are values led and an industry that while its core purpose is to make people whole, doesn't lead with the value set. It leads with the finance, it leads with the business, it leads with this is what we do. And so we're in what I consider to be a beautiful moment because everything is possible, Sid. And I think that's what really stops people. I think we're used to having a, this is what we've done before so we can do it again and it will be successful. But as millennials, you and I have grown up in a world that has been constantly changing. Mm -hmm. The amount of tech growth, like you sit in tech, the amount of tech growth we've had just since you've been in your career, much less since we were kids, is astronomical. The world and how it was built for insurance several hundred years ago is not the world that we live in now. Mm -hmm. And so this moment is calling for more from us. And that's scary. It's scary as hell, if I may. Um, because here we are faced with an existential crisis in the middle of a thousand other existential crises. And so what do we do about it? And when we write the history of this moment in insurance, what do we want it to say about us? And I think that's the cool part about this is that we have the chance to make true impact in our world. All of us, everybody in insurance, not just me, not just you sitting in the places that we sit, but anybody in this industry has the power to make change. Mm -hmm. And that's the part that I really want to get across to folks because I think there is a little bit of paralysis in all of us. I was that person. I remember in 20, I want to say it was like 2017, I was sitting in the home office, not owners 
I was a work comp underwriter. And I remember vividly going, man, I wish somebody would fix this. Thinking about gender equality at the time, mm-hmm. not all of the other issues, but specifically what was like hammering me at the time. Man, I wish someone would fix this. I would be so happy to get involved and help them. But I didn't know what to do. I wanted somebody to tell me, this is what you do and then it gets better. Mm-hmm. But I think the beauty of this moment is that we get to figure that out together. And I think that's what's scary is that it requires us to do more. It requires us to change in a moment that we really didn't want to change. We had to change so much over the past couple of years. We have more to do, what? But I think what this moment does for all of us is gives us a chance to come together and say, this is what we want. Mm -hmm. This is what we want in our industry. This is what we want in our world. And this is how we can do it. And we can do it together. Mm. So talk me through, you've laid out three, three challenges in the industry there. Are those... Th- those aren't specific to DEI. Like there, there are DEI problems, right? Around, I think what I would call passive maybe discrimination and active discrimination. Um, then there's issues in the industry that we're facing that I think DEI could help solve. They're not they're not specific to DEI, but they're. I think, and, and one, once we start talking about what insure quality is doing, I think that will come out. But correct me where I'm wrong there. Is that is that your understanding of the situation too, or am I missing something there? No, I think you've I think you've nailed it. I think we have multiple situations going on, and I mm-hmm. think one of the issues that we continue to have is that we've made DEI the separate business practice, mm-hmm. the separate mm-hmm. funnel, and really what it needs to be is just part of what we do, part of who we are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I understand the struggle with that because here we are, an industry that requires continuing education um, and offers it too. So we've got, you know, CPCU, all of the institutes designations that you can get. You can get advanced learning if you want. You don't have to have it if you don't want to. Um, then you've got things like SHRM. You've got all of these different ways that you can learn. And we've already got jam-packed days and jam-packed schedules. And we're like, wait, you want me to learn something else? I don't have the time. Just tell me what to do Mm -hmm. because it's easier right and what we've done is we've grown up in a society where something that would have massively helped all of us is now something that we need to learn so that we can be better leaders better employees better citizens better collaborators it's a you know it's a bit of a temper tantrum and it's one that i've thrown personally um because you're like i've already been through so much you know, I I didn't have the easiest childhood. Why why is this required of me? Mm-hmm. And what I will say is this: it's not required of you. It isn't. This is a choice to be a better human, to unlearn, learn, to grow, to change is always a choice. Mm-hmm. It's always something that we all have. But I will tell you, as someone that threw her temper tantrum a few years ago, and has gone on the journey and still has her temper tantrums from time to time. I am not perfect. Um, It is so much better and more enriching and lovelier on this side of things. And what I mean by this side is the part where I've acknowledged where I've gotten it wrong because I have gotten it wrong a lot. Mm -hmm. I've atoned for it Mm -hmm. and I've been asked to and also when I haven't been asked to, um, I've worked to make amends. And lastly, I am consistent consistently questioning my own belief system Mm. because so much of what we were taught growing up we are now finding out to be untrue or the result of something that was just passed down time and time and time and time Mm -hmm. again so i would say is yes you're right that there's the specific in quotes dei issues and then you know other issues that we're facing as an industry and dei can solve for all of this but it cannot solve for it if we've decided that this is a different business function with a different budget that requires us to look at it as a segment and pull mm-hmm. it out as its own P&L. Mm-hmm. This, should, this should be an integrated practice in everything that we do. Mm-hmm. And the reason for that has been made time and time again, but I'll bring it back forward for all of us. This is the business case. Innovative teams are more diverse. Mm-hmm. Companies that are more profitable are more diverse. Women-led companies are more profitable. These are facts. This is not me just saying, oh, you should do this and wouldn't it be nice and it'd be cute. No, these, these have been proven time and time again. And we can put the numbers out there 
and we can say that we have griefs about something politically or not, but I just had a conversation with somebody earlier today, and this has been ringing around in my head. Equality is a humanitarian issue. Mm -hmm. It's not a political issue. Mm -hmm. And so I don't care what side of the aisle you sit on. I know which side I sit on, and that's fine, and we can have a discussion about that, but inherently DEI is not a political conversation. And that's where I think we get hung up because it's like, oh, well, if we agree to this, then we agree to this. No, if you agree that everybody should be treated fairly and equitably in this industry, that doesn't have to influence your politics at all. Mm -hmm. But it should influence how you do your work. Mm. Okay, so. So. All right. All right. I know we want a lot of places. (laughs) But you you've just started to like unravel that third onion layer, which is the the solution. Right. Yeah. So, so it's, and I find it's so hard to get to the solution because everybody gets stuck on the problem. Um, so I want to address that really quickly. You know, there's a, there's a group of people listening right now who are saying to themselves, I'm hearing what Alyssa and Sid are saying. I'm, I'm hearing that, you know, diversity uh, is, is a problem in the industry. I, I don't know that I, I, I fully believe that. I don't know that I acknowledge or, or I, I agree, I guess, right, that, it, that it's a problem. Right, right. right? There's, a, there's a group of people who are, who are saying that to themselves, even if they're not saying it out loud. And to, to those of you who are saying that to yourself, I would say just suspend for a second, just suspend that it, whether you agree or not, right, what I would call that judgment, right, on whether it's a problem or not. Just suspend that for a second and let's talk about what the industry could look like in a different state. And without, you know, again, let's not even put that, we've talked about the problem, we've addressed it, right, okay? Whether or not you agree with that, just suspend the emotional response that you might be having, any fear or discomfort, yeah, you but put that away for just a sec and let's just talk about what this world could look like and the reason I ask you to do that is because um, I, I, I think walking into this world without that negative emotional response is important right don't let the fear of well is this a problem or isn't it a problem or agreement cloud the you know well would it be so bad if I had somebody who is queer working with me for me Would it be so bad if somebody who was a female or black or, uh, you know, was leading the team, right? Would it be so bad? Um, And and let's just talk about what that ideal state could look like, the solution, without getting too wrapped up into the problem. So um, walk me through this. Like, what? how is Ensure Equality thinking about this? What are you guys doing? I know you mentioned there's some, you know, tactical things that you're doing as far as uh, award-winning technology. You guys have a, a pledge, and uh, but there's also some strategic work you're doing with the summit and and building different relationships. So walk me through the the master yes. plan here. I, I will absolutely. And the other thing I'll add to what you said because I think it's incredibly important that we do suspend kind of our judgment of this because it's so easy to get into the emotions of it. So easy to go there. Um, it's so important for us to think about who we would be in that situation if it happened to us. Um, I think I, I want to start there for a second and then I'll start going into the, the pieces because I think anytime we have a society in which we've created boxes for ourselves, if we continue on that train of thought, more boxes, this is how you fit, this is who you are. If we can exclude some boxes, we can exclude any boxes. So the goal of the work that we're doing is to literally, like you said, think outside of the box. We don't need the boxes. We can be ourselves. We can be our full intersectional beings at work. And wouldn't that be a dream? Now, I know that I'm a millennial, which by virtue makes me a bleeding heart, which by virtue means that, you know, like I've I've got that soft spot and, you know, I'm so idealistic and the world that I'm dreaming of couldn't exist. But... Like Sid said, let's just suspend that for a second. And if you could dream with me for a minute, imagine going to a workplace where you walked in wearing what felt right for you at the hour that you work best 
and then you still had time at the end of the day to go home and be with the people you love. That's it. I'm not asking to replace you. I'm not asking to completely gut this industry, burn it down, and then start over with something else. I know the word phoenix really kind of evokes <laughs> that, like, let's burn it down and start over. Um, but I think it, it kind of ignores the pain that so many have suffered already. So we're going to put that aside. And we're going to talk about some tactics. We're going to talk about um, some of the pieces that we're working on. So a couple of things. One is Phoenix. I've already mentioned it. You've mentioned it. It's our award-winning tech product. And what we're trying to do with that is be able to objectify subjective information. So the insurance industry, well known. We have so much data. I don't actually have the verbiage. Like, I don't know how far up, like I know it goes uh, terabyte and then like petabyte. I don't know what's beyond that, but I think that's how much data we have. Um, and so what we don't typically do though, is think about how it feels. Hmm. So what we've been trying to quantify is what culture feels like. And the goal with that is to help folks in the industry find their best culture fit, their best match and to help employers understand what's actually being felt. Mm -hmm. I think it's very easy to have that emotional rise happen when we start talking about insurance because there's so many people, like you said, that's like, oh, I don't experience that or my company is great. And that's wonderful. That's the goal, that's the dream state. So if you're experiencing that, thank you. I'm so excited, I'm so excited, but you're in the minority. We want everyone to feel that way. And we can come together to get to that feeling, to get to that issue. So it's not a policing. It is a, this is the data. This is, this is what's happening. What do you want to do with it? And how can we help you get there? We just launched our certification program that we worked with the University of Chicago Board Fellows Program on. We got accepted for our second year. We're working on another project that we'll launch hopefully next year or the year after. But the goal is to show you how DEI integrates into a business plan. So what we've done is we've created this six weeks to three months program because insurance, you know, we have our downtimes and we have our uptime, certainly. So we want to make sure that it builds into your schedule. But what we do is we actually help you understand who your stakeholders are, where you want to spend your time in business, how to access that and how to do it all through a DEI lens. Mm. So it's not learning DEI, it's learning business as it relates to that DEI piece. And that's what I think is incredibly mm -hmm. powerful because they're walking mm -hmm. away with an actual business plan that they can then execute on. Mm -hmm. And you're doing it in a cohort mm -hmm. with coaches. So you're not gonna be alone through the process. You'll have somebody holding your hand the whole way. Cause like you said at the beginning, it's uncomfortable, right? To examine yourself. Yeah. I don't know if anybody's ever stood in front of the mirror, even for like a short amount of time, you're always going, oh, I don't like this or I don't, it's hard. It's mm -hmm. very hard, but the relationships that I have that are the deepest, the most profound, the ones that I hold in the highest regard are the ones that we've had to fight for, mm -hmm. that we've had to work for. Mm -hmm. And this is where we're at with insurance. How do we want this industry to be? Mm -hmm. I think it's important that we have that conversation. So that's a piece of it. The summit is a big piece as well. Um, we just launched our first one in September this year. Can was... I can I pause you before oh, you get course, to the summit? Of okay, because the summit is going to take us. I we have a you lot will. to talk about with that. You so do. let me talk about the business. I just want to dive into the business piece really fast. So f I want to make this tangible for people. So if you could think of an example of because people are going to listen to this and say, "Wow, well, but." Okay, so that's that's all the, the ideal state is, is like everybody feels comfortable and accepted at work and they can bring their whole selves like this. I mean, I, yeah, of course I have that at, at my office. I, I, I don't judge people. I don't see color. I, I Whatever, you know, people can do what they want, right? We just, we have boundaries, right? But, you know, so I, I think it's important to make it tangible. And let me give a quick example of of this. So... What's hard is to, it's easy to hear this and not look in that mirror and put that lens on ourselves and say, how am, how am I experiencing myself from another person's point of view, right? And, and that's, it's very weird and difficult, but give, let me give you a quick example. My dad, who is a, an insurance agency owner, when I was 22, 
this was in 2012. Uh, I went home during college and we were sitting in the kitchen and we were discussing different things. At the time I was uh, participating in an activity at school called, an extracurricular activity called um, moot court. And the moot court case that year happened to be about gay marriage. Mm. Okay, so there's context. So we're discussing this as a family. My family's very religious. My school is very religious. I, at that point, had not come out to myself, and uh, but very much gay. <laughs> and you know, we were sitting across the table. We were talking about the case. We were talking about arguments on both sides. And he, you know, happened to make the comment, "Well, you know, I wouldn't be comfortable with a gay person." owning my business, right? Like I wouldn't be comfortable giving my business to a gay person. And, you know, again, I'm not self-aware of like what's going on inside me. So I, at the, in that moment, just kind of like it, 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 I remember it stinging and it was like, Ooh, okay. That's, that's interesting. Right. But I wasn't quite self-aware of everything that was going on, you know, reflect back on that years later. I, I don't think he realized the impact of those words, right? I, I truly don't think he did. I think he was coming at it from the perspective of, like, I'm a religious guy who is trying to do the right thing, who defines right as this set of things, and I have to protect my belief system, the business, my clients, you know, society, and in that protection, I have to then exclude this group of people, right? I have to make it this thing, which is leadership in the business, inaccessible to those people. And it came with the best of intentions, right, in his mind, and yet it landed in the worst way possible. And so that is this dichotomy that we live in where it's so difficult to, and and I do it to all the time, right? I, I get. I realize this is a, an example where that I'm experiencing, but many examples of you know situations where I haven't done a good job of creating that inclusion for other people, and so we're all sort of susceptible to this, and it's very difficult. So, help make this tangible. When you say of business, course. you know, hey, we're going to help your business be more inclusive, right? Like, what are some of the things that you help with? In, in that setting. We can get out of it. No, yeah. I think that's a, thank you for pulling us back to that. I think it's incredibly important. And um, wow, thank you so much for sharing. That is such a deeply meaningful story and so impactful for me too, even hearing it on this side. So I know that the listeners are going to resonate with that. I'd like to start with some stories on my side if I can, because there's a couple and I can take it from the positive not that yours is negative inherently. I mm -hmm. think it's an important piece of this, but let me talk about the positivity in creating some inclusion. Mm -hmm. So when I was in my MBA program, I was taking a law class. I'm fascinated by law. I love it. I spent some of my time working on work comp, which is pretty much all case law. So it's fantastic. Um, and I was one of those people that was like, don't put first woman in business or first woman in leadership, like that dilutes the fact, why can't I just be a leader? I was one of those people. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until the second year of my MBA that I changed my tune and here's why. I was reading this law textbook and every single pronoun was she, her, every single one. And at first I caught it and I was like, oh, okay, I registered. Oh, okay, Jennifer did this and Sasha did this. And then I get to the second page and I don't remember at what point I started crying and what point I started flipping through more pages, but there was this deep realization that for the first time I saw myself represented in every example in that text. And I wept, I sobbed on the floor for 20 minutes because it was the first time I realized how much I needed to see it, mm. how much I needed to know that I was capable of being there, that I didn't have to, with brute force, push my way through every single thing 
that I encountered, that if a law textbook can include me, then I can practice law. Hmm. And so I think there's a definite piece and probably the piece we hear more, which is the negative impact that exclusion has. But I think what's important to pull out in some of these moments too, is the positive influence that inclusion has. Because what we're finding in candidates that are becoming leaders, especially those that are typically in underrepresented groups, is that they don't feel like they can raise their hand. And we have the data to back that up. So holding both of those things in, inside your brain <laughs> while you're sitting with us through this um, potentially uncomfortable conversation, I think is really important. So when we talk about the tangible pieces that you can get out of going through the certification process with us, what you're getting is a chance to hear things that you wouldn't normally get the chance to hear mm. because you are creating a space where it is okay to say them mm -hmm. and not just okay to say them, but necessary in order to be able to pull everybody together. Okay. So, yeah. Wow. Stop for a second. So okay. <laughs> if, oof, okay. And and it took me, so I said that story was in 2012. Uh, it took 10 years for my parents and I to have an honest conversation. Wow. 10 years, okay? And look, we still disagree on things. Like, I, we're, I, there's no fairy tale ending here, right? I, I, I mean... I, I don't want to paint that picture, but I will be, you know, I, I would regret it for the rest of my life if I didn't have the conversation. And I have a feeling that my parents think the same thing. Like, I, I just have this feeling that as, you know, as prideful as we all are, as we all want to be, we're sitting on our, de on our deathbed, right? And we're looking back at our life and we're saying missed opportunities to have that conversation is so, I mean, that is the most important work. So to, yes. to understand each other and learn how to be understanding in our daily practice, wow. So like, yes, that's just, <laughs> there, I, I thought, yeah. and here's what I, th I thought you were gonna say, well, Sid, we, you know what we do? We put um, men and women on the restroom and then, you know, we have like pajama day. And like, see, you see what I mean? I can Wouldn't see people nice? say, no, I yeah, saying this calls. yeah right. for sure right like that's what they thought you were going to say and you're saying no we're going to the root which is talking to each other and having an yeah. honest conversation in an authentic space like yes yes okay i'll give you a little bit more than that because i think it's necessary and thank you for like resonating so deeply with it because the reaction that you're having is exactly the reaction we've gotten from employees, mm -hmm. which I think is exactly what people want to hear because here we are on two sides of the fence, right? Very similar mm -hmm. to you and your parents. I think mm -hmm. this is a perfect example and analogy for this going, I believe this, I believe this, and you're continuing in that belief without actually knowing the root of it, right? Mm -hmm. So we mm -hmm. start out the certification with people doing a deep dive on themselves. Mm -hmm. So, we will get to the point of business, that's where we spend most of the time, but one of the things that we make sure that we do is we have people identify how they describe themselves, mm -hmm. what they need from the office, because sometimes you didn't come out to yourself for quite some time, I was the same way. It took me a very long time to understand what it was that I was experiencing. Mm -hmm. I think we all have those moments in life where we go, oh, that was it. <laughs> and so it gives you the moment to reflect on yourself and what you need in an office environment. We call it rules of engagement for my military people out there. You know what that means? Yep. How can people best work with you? And it starts there. It starts in, this is how I really like to receive feedback. This is how I like to receive praise. This is the best way to get a quick answer out of me. This is the best way to get an effective answer out of me. Mm -hmm. And that's how you can start to build everything else. Mm -hmm. That's when we start walking through the mission, vision, values of the organization. Does that resonate with everybody? Mm -hmm. And I think something that I haven't talked about as loudly or proudly as I should have is the IE team baited the certification together mm -hmm. um, at the beginning of this year. Mm -hmm. And here we are, you know, a team that does this work all day, every day with each other, right? We changed our values because of this conversation. Mm -hmm. Because what it did that was different than all of the other conversations and meetings and 
chances for feedback that we had was it put us all in a room with the purpose of talking specifically about that. Mm -hmm. And we just let happen whatever needed to happen. And as a leader, as a, as, as a co-founder, it's uncomfortable hearing people go, oh, I don't like this. Mm -hmm. But you know what's awesome? They told you. Mm -hmm. Because here's another tangible piece of why integrating DEI, why having this conversation at all is important. And it'll harken back to when I was with the agency. Okay, so after the moment with the pornographic video, mm -hmm. everything I did was monitored to the nth degree. And mm -hmm. I knew that, I'm, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not a moron. I, I knew that they were watching everything that I did. And it got to the point where I was more willing to do the wrong thing because I had something in writing from them backing it up than I was to talk to them about what I thought was right or to actually do what I knew was right. Mm -hmm. And that's where you're losing. Mm -hmm. You're losing in inches, not miles. Mm -hmm. and you're losing because of the fear that permeates your workforce. People are afraid to mess up. They're afraid to atone for it because they feel like atonement is retaliation. Mm -hmm. And they're afraid to disagree. Mm -hmm. And so we're creating cultures of groupthink. We're creating cultures of silence. Mm. And this, more than, I, it's so funny, the number one question I get from folks when I travel and when I speak is, what's the number one thing that can have the most impact on your DEI program? Like right now, today, what can we do? Mm -hmm. And the answer is always the same. Listen. Mm -hmm. People tell you exactly what they need. They may not say it directly because they've learned not to say it directly, but they will always tell you what they need. And so this, more than anything, gives you that opportunity to know what it is that your folks need and it builds tangible loyalty. And when you've all created that North Star that you need to head to, my God, does that make it easier when you're all heading in the same direction. And so what we're doing is creating ways for people to have that tough conversation and to do it with coaches so that you're not forced to try to elect a leader that's going to do that. There's always going to be bias there, but you can look to somebody else. There's no hierarchy in this. So this isn't your leadership team and then your marketing team and then your accounting team going through it. We're mixing the group. Mm -hmm. We're bringing everybody together in one spot and going, what do you think you would do if you sat here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I often think about stories of innovation back from my MBA or my undergrad where they talked about opening up a conversation or a question to the group of people. And that's how post-its were invented. Oh, that's, that's how, interesting. <laughs> it's how so many other pieces of our world were invented because they were like, how would you use a reusable sticky product? Mm -hmm. And somebody was like, well, I need to find my place in my hymn book and all of the pieces of paper that I stick in there fall out. Huh. Voila, there you post-its go. for Art Fred. You can Google that one too. Um, but the goal is to create a tangible outcome through a DEI lens. And DEI, in this case, doesn't mean that you're bringing in black voices, queer voices, women voices, disabled voices, neurodivergent voices, et cetera. It means that you understand that all of you come to it from a different background, from a different perspective. Yeah. And that you can honor each of those in this process. Right. Yeah, I, I think of the... So... You mentioned this is a different conversation, you know, than just asking for feedback. And I think actually it's interesting. We've talked about this at Vertifor too. Sometimes you don't, when you read those surveys and you send them out and you ask for feedback, you don't get the feedback that you actually want because, and, and people say, oh, I didn't ask the question right. Or it was an, it was a, you know, it was not enough open-ended questions, too many questions with possible multiple choice answers uh, pre-written. Um, and so the survey is the problem. And, you know, could be, I'm not saying it's not. Um, but I think there's more to it than that, right? And so to even get to that, 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 quality of feedback that you want you have to ask yourself whether you have an environment and a culture in your business that actually you know inspires that or creates that and you have to have when you ask for feedback you're asking for vulnerability even if it's anonymous 
even if it's anonymous, you're asking for people to be in a vulnerable space, right? The anonymous part is just, hey, you know, there's no fear of anybody hunting you down, right, if you say something. But but to even be able to get people into that vulnerable headspace to answer that question is different than the an- anonymity. Well, to get vulnerability, you have to have trust, and to get trust, you have to have safety. Yep. And so you have to have uh, that conversation should come first, I guess, right? And this is bigger than yes. than labels, you know, social minorities. This is, it's. I, I would say it's even more than that, right? So it's about um, humanity, our yes. shared humanity. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And knowing that, like, despite all that we've been through in the past half decade together. Yep. We can recognize that humanity in each other. Yeah. And that's been the key. I think I remember growing up and politics wasn't what it is now. And people would often disagree and that was okay. And Mm -hmm. I think it's okay to get back to the, I think you said it beautifully earlier. It's okay to get back to the place where we don't agree, Mm -hmm. but we can respect how people think about something Mm -hmm. and like let the emotions sit to the side. And I think, this is an incredible representation of that because when I was in banking, we went through a survey, a work survey that was supposed to give a little widget to our company if, if they attained whatever level they were trying to attain. And I was 22, you know, so I'm so excited. I remember being thrilled because my company wants to know what I think. Absolutely. So I'm in there, you know, as a young 20 something or like recent grad, I am feeling, I've got a paragraph written. I'm writing a full-on dissertation of this is how I would do it. This is what I would change. This is where we're experiencing this. I'm giving honest feedback, candid, because this is my first time doing a work survey. I am so excited. Two weeks later, we get an email saying, hey, we got that thing that we were trying to get, and then nothing else. Right. Yeah. And so I think what companies are experiencing right now is we know. We know that you're paying to get a widget on a website. Mm-hmm. Are you actually going to do anything with this? Mm-hmm. And this gives you a tangible business plan as you leave. Mm. So it's no longer a, hey, we did the thing. We're great. Mm-hmm. It is a, we did the thing. Now we know where we're going. Mm. Mm. Okay. Now so- we know what we're changing. Now we know what we're fixing. Now we know how to get better together. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it probably looks different for every business, I'm sure. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Which is why we yeah. change the time frame depending on how yeah. it makes sense to you and, and your team. Because, you know, we're in Q4 heading into Q1. They aren't the easiest <laughs> times of year for insurance professionals. Absolutely. Yeah. Don't remind me. It's almost 2024. It's crazy. I know. Stop. <laughs> um, okay. So, so let's talk about the summit because this is sort of the, I feel like we what we've talked about is, um, you know, the business uh, plan is is the tangible, um, or not not tangible, but it's the, hey, this is this is how we start to you know s- chip away at getting to this ideal state, right? This is sort of our this is how we create our north star. This is right, and then and then there's the summit, which after talking to you about it, feels like this is what it should feel like when we get there, right? This is the ideal state. So, so talk to me a little bit about what the summit was like, the feedback you got, um, you yeah. have things that you're going to do next year. Yeah. Um, so for those who didn't know or, or haven't seen, we called it a shift in perspective and we held it in an art gallery, which I'm immensely proud of because I mean, the art nerd in me geeked out a little bit about saying, Hey, we're going to talk about perspective in an art gallery. Nice. Um, but we were on the coffee, right? Nice. Here we are. Yeah. We had a couple of <laughs> photographers in the room as well. It was fantastic. But really what we wanted to do is take everybody out of the environment that they're typically used to being in, in a conference in general. And we did that. So we automatically brought the mood down. You don't have to be stuffy, buttoned up. Fine. You can show up, come as you are is a typical phrase that we that we use at IE. So it was about 120 insurance professionals from across the country, and it wasn't just insurance professionals. And I think that is what I love the most about it, because I think for the first time, insurance professionals are starting to see how much our communities and stakeholders are caring about this conversation. Mm-hmm. And simultaneously, you're starting to see this group of people that are like, oh, I do care about it, and I want to get involved. Mm-hmm. I want to be in insurance. And as I think about young folks that are either graduating from high school, college, or just wanting to get into the workforce, 
this is now an option. And I'm also thinking about the scores of people that have been laid off over the course of the past couple of years, considering where do I go? How can I use what I have in a place that will accept me for me? And we saw all of that. And I think what was incredibly powerful was how everybody showed up. Everybody showed up so hard, Sid. And what I mean by that is they didn't dress any specific way to please us. They showed up wanting to meet other people and work with other people and learn. We started the day with a shame shake, something that we coined, I guess. Um, so what we were saying is we're going to go there. We're going to have conversations that are uncomfortable, very much like the way that you started our podcast today. And we said, you're going to miss something. There's going to be a moment where you're like, oh, I've done that before. But you know what? The best way to grow is to not hold on to that shame. So we're going to shake it out and we're going to move on. And what it did was allowed all of us to have this beautiful conversation. I am so sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I <laughs> but it did. <laughs> but it did was allow all of us to have this beautiful conversation where nobody was policing anybody. Hmm. Everybody just got to have the stage to talk about whatever it was in the way that they needed to talk about it. And it was insanely gorgeous. Mm. We didn't have a single all white panel. We didn't have a single all male panel. And I think that in particular was great because as we look across the landscape of insurance and we see what's out there, that's typically what we see. And again, I wanna reiterate, it's not that I don't like white men. <laughs> it's that typically that's who's making all of the decisions. Mm -hmm. If we continue to let other people into these conversations, it doesn't have to be that focus. Mm -hmm. But when we're only seeing one demographic continue to run an entire industry, that's when we're going to start to have issues. Not because they are not intelligent or experienced or whatever it may be, and they can certainly have diversity of thought. But what it does is inadvertently and intentionally exclude other people from the conversation your point again, going from six seats to as many as we need to accomplish the goals that we have ahead of us. And so what we ended the day with was this incredible excitement about what this industry could be. Mm. The comment that I heard time and time again was, normally when I leave a conference, I'm so drained and I could not be more excited about where this industry is going, where it is headed, how I can be a part of it. Like we truly saw change makers at every level of the organization show up and go, this is what insurance looks like. This is what I wanna be a part of. Mm. And um, for those of you that are struggling to get diversity into your recruiting process, into your onboarding process, what I will say is the comment we heard repeatedly also was, this is the most diverse group of insurance professionals I've ever seen mm. over and over and over and over again because we opened the door and we said, the conversation you wanna have is welcome here. We didn't, we didn't police what people could talk about. We put them on a stage, had very broad categories. The first one was intersectionality. We're gonna do that call back from the very beginning. And people talked about what that meant to them, how it felt to them. We had people that were biracial talking about it, people that were not in the industry talking about it and how it impacted them. And for the first time, certain people and certain groups felt like they could be seen and heard. They were having that moment that I had sobbing on the floor on my second year of my MBA, reading every pronoun as she, her. Mm -hmm. mm. And that's where we get to go. Mm. Is well, all, I mean, tears are gonna be a necessary part of it, right? We can think about blood, sweat, and tears. But in this case, I think they were a lot more happy than sad. Yeah. Oh man, that's beautiful. I love to hear about it. So you guys are holding the summit next year. We are August 26th and 27th. I haven't said okay. that publicly yet, so you get to be All the right. first to come that. Yes, um, we'll take it. We're, we're, we're toying with where it's going to be, but it will not be in a traditional conference center. I can promise you that. And okay. the goal of next year is going to be a shift in systems. So we're going to be talking about the systems that we currently operate in, the ones that are seen and unseen, and what it means to navigate them. I think sometimes when people think of this work, they think that we're here to disrupt, burn it to the ground. I think I mentioned that earlier. But the goal sometimes is to say, hey, like a lot of this is really good. How do we use what we already have and not do additional work for everything else? Mm -hmm. And so that's going to be the basis of the conversation. But some of the conversations that I'm hoping to have are on gender, mm -hmm. are on generations. Mm -hmm. I think that would be a really powerful system that we could we could talk about in the space. But also, how about the other ones that intersect with insurance, like medicine? 
-hmm. or like having, you know, a a satellite office versus the home office Mm because that culture feels very different too. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go there in a lot of places and in a lot of ways and everybody is welcome to the conversation. Something that we did last year that we're absolutely going to do again is offer a scholarship ticket because you shouldn't have to worry about money to be a part of important conversations that are happening in your industry. I love that. That's wonderful. That's really cool. All right. So where can people find out more about getting involved, whether it's through the conference or the the business plan? Like how, how can people take action? They can go straight to insurequality.org. There's several ways to interact there or find me on LinkedIn. I, I tend to be more active. Um, certainly as we get to the end of the year, I might be a little more delayed, but I will be there. So you can look me up online. It's Alyssa Stamp, E-L-I-S-A, and then a postage stamp with an F on the end. Um, but yeah, awesome. reach out to us on the website. Interact with us on our social media. Our, our biggest community is on LinkedIn because we're dealing with professionals in their everyday in their everyday lives. So everybody's welcome. Everybody's voice is needed in this conversation. And you don't have to be somebody that has been in the industry for 30 plus years to be a value add to this conversation. There's so many ways to show up and to share your voice. And I think that is what fuels me every day. Mm. Mm. Thank you for coming on. Seriously, I appreciate it. Uh, This was a fantastic conversation, much needed in in the industry. really, really excited that we got to host it here at Vertifor. And I hopefully, hopefully it won't be the last time uh, we host this type of conversation here at the Vertifor Insurance Podcast. So I hope not. And I hope it's with a lot of other people too. I would love that. I would love that. I feel like there's a whole list of people that should be on based off what I heard about the summit. So I'll ping you on that. Um, Absolutely. All right. Well, for those of you guys listening, thank you for having a tough conversation with us. Thanks for sticking in there uh, to the end. We appreciate it. Hopefully we've given you a lot to think about. Um, Of course, if you have any questions, you know where to find Alyssa and the team. And, um, you know, for those of you who are um, weathering whatever storm you might be weathering, whatever that looks like, thanks for continuing to believe in and commit to the industry. Um, thanks for not leaving because I've seen I've seen that happen and we need good people to stay and uh, you know continue to have the tough conversations. So appreciate y'all and look forward to the next one. We'll see you then. Well, that was a great episode. Amazing. It was an amazing episode. I really enjoyed that content. Guys, if you enjoyed that content and you want more of it, make sure you hit the subscribe button. Nah, dude. You got to tell them to crush it. Crush that subscribe button, guys. All right. Whether you want to crush it, smash it, hit it. Bop it? Sure. We could bop it. Either way, guys, we don't want you to miss another episode. We enjoy spending time with you, the VIP. Yeah. We'll see you next week.